be here in front of you today. My name is Marta Lopez Flor, and I'm the recruitment and retention coordinator for the Kemmons Wilson School. For those of you who do not know, the Kemmons Wilson School is where they offer sport and leisure management, hospitality management, and now culinary arts as majors in our in our university. So we're gonna really tap into the brains of these professionals here today and try to get some advice for you guys as to what your next move is. So as things are coming up into your heads, just jot down your questions. There is going to be time for Q&A, but I have some guided questions to start our conversation. So before you today, you have Chef Bill Mullins. He's our first and official chef hire at the Clemens Wilson Culinary Institute. If you don't know, we now have a culinary institute in Cordova, and we're excited about that new program launch. All right, next to Chef Bill, we have Shelly Kemp with the Memphis Grizzlies. She is an HR coordinator for the Memphis Grizzlies, so definitely prep some questions for her. <laughs> um, she can. She has a, a rich career in HR, and she knows what it what she, you know the industries are looking for in terms of bringing talent on board. And then to her right, your left, is Andre Jackson. Andre is unique because he studied hospitality and he actually went into that field. Um, he's, he's been a really treasured uh, friend of the Kemmons Wilson School program. He works at um, Caesars Entertainment. So if you have ever been to Tunica, the Horseshoe and Roadhouse Casinos in Tunica, that's all Andre's work there, okay? And then finally, we have a recent graduate from our program, Nicholas Williams. Nicholas is at the New Hampton Inn and Suites in Germantown, so he, he has a really intentional insight as to what it takes to open a newer property. Um, so there are a lot of good levels of experience here, so I'm gonna get this party started with the first question. And, it wasn't on any questions I shared before, but I'm curious to know, because it is National First Generation Student Day, were any of you first generation students? And first generation means that neither of your parents graduated from college, okay? Yeah, I was. Um, I actually was the first one in my family to go to college. I was the first one in my family to go to any kind of advanced school. Uh, I graduated from Mississippi State University and. Uh, 1996, uh, and then the Culinary Institute of America in 2003. Uh, so I've kind of bounced around all over the place myself. I'm a lifelong learner myself, and eventually hope to be like one of you guys. I'll be a student here as well. So, <laughs> anyone else, first gen? Me too. Okay. <laughs> Where so, did you go to school? I uh, I went to Central Michigan University. That's where I received my master's degree. Um, my bachelor's degree is from right here in Memphis. I went to a small Christian private school called Crichton College and uh, graduated, um, let's see, organizational management was my major in undergrad and then human resources was my major in um, master's, okay. from a master's degree. Um, I've also gone to North Central University and um, continue my education, but I'm, I'm the first one out. Okay, so another lifelong learner. All right, Andre? So I'm not the first one out. My dad uh, actually graduated from Diller University in New Orleans. My mom, she was originally from Jamaica and uh, she did not go to college, but my brother and sister both went to college as well. Brother went to Texas Tech, my sister went to North Texas and Dallas, and then I went to University of Houston and I also majored in hospitality management, hotel and restaurant management. I got my degree from there. Okay. Yes. Little known fact, I went to University of Houston for one semester. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Nick? So no, I'm not a first generation student. Can you say where you did go to school? And uh, yeah, so I graduated here from the University of Memphis. I was a graduate of the Kimmins Wilson School of Hospitality and resort management. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, so just so you know, I attended uh, Columbia University. I was a first generation student. It was kind of shocking for me as a first gen student at a prestigious school. But I, I know that had I not gotten the scholarship that sent me to the high school that I went to, I would have never had that opportunity. So really, um, for those of you who are first gen, please know that we're here as a resource for you because we want to see you know you thrive. And also students who are 
you know, maybe your parents did go to school, but it's so different being a student now than it was even when I went to school years ago. So um, know that there are a lot of people who want to see you succeed. It's not just about getting into school, it's about completing your studies. Okay, so now that we know your undergraduate degrees, I'm curious to know how many times did any of you change your majors? <laughs> the question, yeah. <laughs> so, see, what had happened was I started <laughs> out in engineering, so I got all my math. I was going to be an electrical engineer. My dad worked for the telephone company. He was a lineman, supervisor. He was an engineer by trade, uh, not by uh, education. So I wanted to do that, too. So I got calculus, one, two, three, and four, networks, one and two, differential equations, one and two, statistics, one and two, and then really decided that that was not what I wanted to do. So I changed majors to sociology. So I got a degree in sociology with a minor in mathematics, and along with that, I ended up getting an uh, emphasis in criminal justice and correctional systems, uh, and uh, worked as a police officer, reserve deputy sheriff, uh, uh, got injured on the job, went into dispatch, and went off and did that, and got my EMT and paramedics license, went off to Texas, and then just burned out. Nope, time to do something different. So I had a background with math and social sociology and criminal justice, and I thought, well, what better thing to do than go to culinary school? <laughs> okay. I changed my major six times. Okay. So when I was at University of Houston, I was a psychology major and I thought I wanted to go into corporate psychology. I took a psychology 101 class and I was really too serious about that. I kept overanalyzing everything. So a bunch of people got together, they gathered around me and they said, you really need to change your major. So I did and I changed my major to accounting I was an accounting major for a full year, and that was boring. And uh, then I went to work for a season. Um, after I went to work for a season, it was probably eight years later, I went back to school and I was going into athletic training, which evolved into physical therapy, which evolved into, oh, I need to go get a job because I'm an adult. So I left school again. And when I finally figured out what I wanted to do with my life, I was 30 plus years old and uh, decided to go back and get a business degree. So here I am, okay. six times. Okay. So it's a journey sometimes, right? It is. It's, a, it's a process, and we don't have to all have it figured out right at the beginning. I think sometimes students put a lot of pressure on themselves, like, and you guys freak out and stress yourselves out, and that's why we have things like the relaxation zone that they were talking about in the previous session in this room, okay? You don't have to have it all figured out. The goal is to finish, though, so especially once you've made um, enough of an investment in your studies, you don't want to keep, you know, a mounting debt. You know, at some point, you got to finish and you got to just find your position. And then if you want to continue your education, you know, by all means, pursue a master's degree. Did anyone else change their majors on this panel? Okay. So I did not change my major. So my story is a little unique. Um, my senior year in high school, they had a program where you left school and you went to a hotel and you kind of did a rotation. So through that program, I ended up getting a scholarship to go to school for hospitality. So I was somewhat locked in because my dad told me, uh, if you want to change, like you're going to be paying for it. So that kind of kept me focused. And I loved hotels, and I, I guess I found my passion early without going through that process. So it was a little bit different, but um, my biggest challenge was do I, do I like hotels or do I like food and beverage? Do I like conventions? Do I like marketing? Do I like accounting? Because hotels and hospitality is a little bit of everything. everything yeah. So then I focused in that I, my, I was more passionate about running hotels versus food and beverage, and I love food and beverage, but it just wasn't as uh, interesting as the hotel side of the business. Okay. What I love about your story, though, Andre, is that you put yourself out there first, right? So sometimes it's just about getting your feet wet and trying an internship or trying a job shadowing opportunity. Do something in your summer so that you can start exploring what opportunities fit 
and what doesn't fit as well. Not everything is a perfect match. And sometimes, like we say here, we have to be driven by doing. We have to actually go out there and like figure it out. Nick, did you change your major? Yeah, so <laughs> I changed it twice. Okay. I uh, started school and didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I was like, well, I guess I'll do business. And so I did economics to start. And yeah, that was not going. Um, <laughs> not going to happen. So then I actually changed it to sport and leisure management. Okay. So I was like, okay, like I like sports. I grew up playing sports, and then I got two semesters, and I was like, no, like this isn't yeah. it. Um, and then the whole time, my dad first wanted me to do engineering. Uh, okay. That clearly didn't happen. And then so he said, well, you should look into hotels. Um, and so I picked up the hospitality major and never looked back. Okay. So the thing with hospitality is that first, well, you can take the job anywhere in the world, right? It's a global enterprise. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And the, as Andre had hinted at, you know, it's such a diverse um, area of study because there's convention centers, there's tourism, there are hotels, there are attractions. There's the culinary side of hospitality. So you really can't get bored in that area of study because there's a little bit of everything. You're going to be doing some sales and revenue management. You're going to be doing some marketing. You're going to be doing you know, some concept design. Um, I love when I first met Andre, he was working on this huge spa project at the hotel. And he was like, I have never been pushed out of my comfort zone but loved it so much. So you never really do get bored in the hospitality industry because you always have to be on the cutting edge. Like, what's the latest thing that a guest is going to want to see? Is it the TV screen that sits in the mirror? Or is it a room that has exercise equipment? Like, it, the industry itself is constantly evolving. And so I think it's appealing for those people who do get bored easily. This industry does really work for you well. Um, so looking back at your undergraduate careers, is there anything that you think you could have done better or differently? Like, if you could go back in time, what would you do differently? So I'll take this one. Um, because I went to that program in high school, they hired me right in. So I worked the entire time from freshman year all the way through. And I wish I would have had more time to enjoy college and get into a fraternity and really just get involved in the, the school. Because I think I was, I was going to class and I'd leave, I'd go to work. And so I, was, I, was, I think I overworked, and I wish I could go back and actually enjoy college because now I'll go back and I'll go to football games or basketball games, and I see how interactive it is and how much fun the students are having. And I miss, I think, some of that stuff because that Saturday when the game was going, I'd have to go to work. Okay. So that is the truth in hospitality. You're usually working when other people are playing. So just recognize that. Usually, like if it's a holiday, like you can't take off Mother's Day in hospitality. That's like a no-no. <laughs> um, so just know that about the industry. Yeah. I, I share some of Andre's insight. <laughs> I, I worked my way through college, and there is a lot of merit uh, for you know working your way through college. And employers do look at that, and they do consider, oh, he worked his way through college, or she worked this job and this job and this job, and oh, she she was a hustler. They also look for your extracurricular activities and what kind of teams you're on and what kind of advisory groups or advisory boards um, you serve on. They they want to see that you were active in some sort of activity while you were in college because they do want to see how you can handle your time in between personal and school, which is business. They, they do mm -hmm. want to see that. And for me, it was all about you know working my way through school. So I did not attend University of Houston, the Cougars. I didn't, I didn't attend games. I you know, didn't belong to student groups. I didn't have a lot of friends while I was at college because all my friends were work friends. And I went to school, I went home, I went to work. That was it. Um, so I would say, and I have a 17-year-old that's getting ready to go to college, hopefully U of M. And uh, I want him to enjoy his time while he's in, while he's in college. And, and be serious, take it seriously. But um, straight A's are not what employers are looking for. 
They're not. They're looking that you complete the degree. They want to know that you can manage your time. They want to know that you can manage a project while you've got all sorts of other things going on. Um, so, you know, have fun while you're in while you're in college. That's what I would have done. Okay. Would anyone else like to contribute to this before I move on to the next question? Uh, my first year in college, I think I spent a little too much time uh, enjoying college. Uh, <laughs> the truth. <laughs> I, <No. laughs> uh, I was in a fraternity. I did the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so um, that was not a conducive environment for me. Uh, having a type A personality, I'm a little bit uh, uh, take charge. So not only was I in a fraternity, but I was the leader of my pledge class. And, um, you know, hence I'm the first one to get into trouble. Uh, so... I enjoyed a little too much, and then all of a sudden, about uh, my sophomore year, middle of my sophomore year, I decided to get serious. Um, and, and I think because of that, it allowed me the opportunity to really focus in on what I needed to because I got it all out. I just got it all out. But that being said, when I went to culinary school, I was president of student council. I was an ambassador for the National Restaurant Association. I was all these different things. But I was also the first one at the party and the last one to leave the party. So, um, you know, you can do both. You can be both. Uh, you just have to manage your time. That's the biggest thing. You have to manage your time effectively. It, and that extends, your, your advice really extends into adulthood, like into being a working person too. Because I, you always hear this thing like, work-life balance and to me it's a it's a misnomer it doesn't exist and I have recently adopted this work-life blending model right so sometimes I'm gonna have to work on a Saturday but you know or take care of some business during my lunch break like it's more of a, of a blending act versus a balance but you do have to be able to manage your time wisely no matter what because an employer is not going to like the work's got to get done in the end so keep that in mind too um nick yeah so mine's kind of blended answers of all uh first two years enjoyed college way too much and then after that i got my full first full-time job um, i was working at the guest house so i was doing 40 hour weeks there and then after I studied abroad, I came back, and that's where I started at the Hampton Inn. And so since basically the mid-junior year, mid-sophomore year, uh, it's just been working 40 hours a week, not, been, have, not really enjoying the college experience because I just work the whole time. Okay. All right. So here's, um, we, we are talking about like what's your next move and you're gonna hear throughout college a lot of people say, oh, you need to find a mentor, you need to find a mentor. So I wanna dig into a, that a little bit more. So I wanna ask our panel, do any of you have mentors and how did you go about developing those relationships? Um, so it's a two part question because I think students sometimes really don't know how to go about forming that mentor-mentee bond. Uh, yeah, I have mentors uh, in various different stages of my life. Uh, when I was working for the Sheriff's Department, I've got uh, a man that I could call on down there. I still call him. I, I see him every now and then. Um, and, and it's constantly one of those things that if I have a conundrum, if I have a problem, I'll run it against him. Um, I have members, uh, mentors in the culinary industry. Peter Timmons from the Greenbrier, uh, fancy five-star, five-diamond property in West Virginia uh, that... Um, when I first interacted with him, I was just a student at culinary school, and he was a, um, uh, a student, I'm going to use that term loosely, uh, in the continuing education department. So he asked me where something was, and I proceeded to talk to him as if he had just started culinary school on day one, uh, not knowing that he was a master chef. So uh, <laughs> that, that's how my relationship started with him. So sometimes it's a matter of happenstance that you find the, the mentor you're looking for. And sometimes it's purpose-driven. I've actually sought out specific people that I want to be in my career field, in my life, in my ability to reach out to. Now, there is a huge difference between a mentor and then someone who is an influencer in your life. A mentor is there to be able to bounce ideas off of them, be able to bounce uh, conundrums and moral uh, ambiguities off of them, someone that can lead you in the right path. So when you choose your mentors, choose your mentors that wisely don't just choose mentors because they think you can you can get something out of them um, from a, a work environment or something like that find someone in your field that you're looking to work with uh, that you're that you respect and that's the biggest thing you have to have respect for them in that process and then 
earn their respect in the process of that. Okay. And tag them on Facebook because nobody changes, everybody changes their phone now. <laughs> Good point. I, I have had mentors over the years. I probably started uh, being mentored in my 30s. I joined a Toastmasters group. Have you ever heard of Toastmasters? Um, I, I joined a local Toastmasters group here in Memphis, Tennessee. So, Shelly, not to yes. interrupt, but for those who don't know what Toastmasters group, can you tell them what yeah. that is? Toastmasters is an awesome resource for anybody and everybody. They have closed groups and they have open groups, but basically they are there um, for, uh, for their participants, for their members, and they help you strengthen your communication skills. So every week you go to a meeting and you sign up for different parts of the meeting and um, some people will give speeches and then some people will evaluate how they did in their speech. So they're looking at how many times you said, um, you know, while you were um, talking. Or they may be watching you to see if you fidget. And so they'll give you that feedback at the end of the meeting. But it's a great way to really develop your public speaking skills. And even if you're not looking to be a public speaker, they really can help you become a more effective communicator because then you can work on how to persuade people or how to sell something or how to present a proposal to your boss, how to get someone to pay for a particular certification that you would like to get. You know, you've got to talk them into it. So they'll teach you how to do that and you can practice at your Toastmasters meeting every week by giving them your spiel. So Toastmasters International, I think it's .org. I believe there is a chapter affiliated with the business school here on campus. So if that's something that you know you want to make your next move, look it up on either on Tiger Zone, but there's usually a local chapter somewhere. Absolutely. Um, the person who, um, get it? <laughs> the person who recommended Toastmasters to me first was Dr. Kathy Tuberville because I guess 15 years ago, she was my professor at Crichton College, and she she directed me to Toastmasters International. So she is on faculty here as well in the School of Business. So please contact her. I'm sure she'll she can tell you all about it. But I found my first mentor at Toastmasters, just somebody I gravitated to, and she gravitated towards me. Her name too was Shelley, so it was Shelley and Shelley. And she has been my mentor for over 10 years now. And we have seasons, you know, mm -hmm. we have seasons. Uh, some seasons we're talking very regularly, maybe every other week, or maybe I'm talking to her through a project that I'm working on because I want to know how she would do it or how she would approach it, or am I thinking about it correctly? Who do I need to know to get this project done? She knows a lot of people. So she just helps me solve problems and she helps me work out how I'm thinking. She challenges me and she also encourages me when I'm feeling pretty bad about myself because we all have our days. And so she will remind me of how great I am and you all need that. You all need someone to tell you how great you are every once in a while. So Shelly does that for me. I've had a few other mentors in my life, but they've been short seasoned. Shelly just kind of sticks. So mentors are great, you gotta find one. Wonderful answer. So I, I've had amazing mentors in my career, and uh, I'll tell you a little story about a mentorship program that we had in our company that I think wasn't set up correctly. So mentorship is probably one of the most important things you all as students can do, even as you go through your career. I've had them early in my career and now even uh, as I've continued to grow in my career. So we had a program where the company knows it's something very, very important that people need. So they would find a really high performing leader and they would put them with somebody that is up upcoming leader. And they put the two people together, they set up meetings, and you're supposed to meet with your, your mentor. And at that time, I was a mentee, so I met with, at the time, it was the VP of HR for the city of Las Vegas I, when I was working out there. 
and it was good, but it just wasn't organic because we didn't have a relationship. We didn't know each other. It seemed forced and it didn't seem natural. So we shared ideas and we talked and we, it was nice, but it just wasn't organic. So I feel like mentorship should be something that's organic. Somebody that similar to Shelly that you click with, mm-hmm. that you have a relationship with, you two can share ideas amongst each other. It's genuine. You both care about each other. And if you do that, I think it's better than just saying, Andre, you and Sh- you're now teamed up with Shelly, but I don't know Shelly, so how we're, we're just talking is not as genuine as actually building a relationship with somebody and then generally wanting you to succeed and watch you grow. And I think it's even beyond work. Mentorship, it helps just in your life, just personal things that you're going, going through because they can work, um, you all can work together with the person that you're with and you just become friends. You become, it's almost like family. So the mentorships that I've got were just kind of lucky and by chance. Um, one of them was a former boss, or both of them former bosses. Uh, one was my manager uh, at the guest house, and then my current one is was my former AGM at the hotel in Germantown. Um, we're just friends, like as much as anything, we hang out. Um, but he is helping me develop along in my career a lot for sure. So one thing with mentor mentee relationships is you have to be open to constructive criticism and you have to not take it personally, although it does feel personal sometimes. So when you have a strong relationship with the mentor, they're they're going to give it to you. They're going to give it to you in a real way sometimes. And it can be shocking because you think, oh, I was on a pedestal with this person and now I, I've fallen. But that's not necessarily the case. The, the reality is, is that you're trying to grow. And so you want someone who is safe to be able to give you that feedback so that you can take the corrective action needed before you go do that in another arena of your life. Um, And so I think it's really important as students look for that right mentor-mentee relationship, can I take constructive criticism, A, and can I take it from this person? Because I've had some students who have considered me their mentor and then they were shocked when I gave them, like, hey, if I were you, I would have handled it this way because this is what happened as a result. And they just felt like deflated and that's never the intention. So be mindful of that when you are entering a relationship um, because it is a give and take. Um, have any of you been able to help your mentors in any way as well? Because I, I have experienced that. I have some younger mentees, especially when it comes to social media, for real, that is not my strength. I I go to them and I'm like, how do I do this? I want to do that boomerang thing, you know, and make it fun. And they give me help, okay? So have any of you um, actually been helpful to your mentors? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just thinking that the best mentors out there were at one point mentees. Uh, You know, if you really want to uh, have a really good mentor, someone that's going to advocate for you, then you should also be willing to mentor someone as well. Whether it's someone younger or someone older, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, I've worked with uh, uh, various youth organizations. I've worked with uh, various uh, fraternal organizations and things along those lines. And I always seem to find myself, because I don't put myself out there as that, but I always seem to find myself someone, somewhere, a gravitational point, somewhere where people can come in and ask me questions. And I think that's because I have always in my career sought out people to ment- uh, to mentor me uh, so because I go out and seek out mentors people seem to come to me and want to be mentored as well okay. anyone else I'm not sure that Shelley learned anything from me <laughs> I mean I'll be very honest I'll be very honest you know she she is a lot further along in her career and in life than I am. I think she's about 15 or 16 years older than me. So I was looking to her to find out how to be successful like her because she is, in my mind, successful and happy and joyful. And she has, you know, all these great things that go on in her life. And I would like to emulate that. So I'm not sure I gave her anything or taught her anything. 
Uh, I think we have evolved into more friends. We actually went to lunch for my birthday this year, first time in like 12 years. Wow. So, I mean, I think that's an evolution of the relationship. Um, I would say, though, when, when you have decided that you would like someone to kind of grow you up, to mentor you, um, look for somebody who you admire or maybe somebody that you would want to emulate, someone that you want their feedback from, because just as Marta was saying, they're gonna give you the bad with the good, and they're gonna give you the ugly with the pretty. So you, you have to be able to take it, and um, whenever you do find someone, or if you do find someone that you would like to be mentored by, uh, it's as easy as asking them. So all you have to do is you know, take them to the side and say, hey, I, you know, really appreciate the conversations that we have and, you know, my goals. I'm here at University of Memphis and I'm trying to do this and this and this and I'd really like to, I don't know, maybe establish a mentor relationship and maybe we could meet once a month. So you could put yourself out there and you could tell them exactly what you're looking for and then they hopefully will reciprocate and say, yeah, I, I would love to be your mentor. So it's, it's easy to, you know, to ask, um, but you, you have to actually say it sometimes so that they know that you expect them to be in your life, you know? Yeah, you do definitely have to establish some boundaries and some, like, guidelines, right, so that you know what the expectations are. Um, if you are looking for a mentor and this person doesn't know that you're looking for that, well, you're kind of setting them up to let you down right? You're setting them up to fail. So you kind of have to spell it out like, hey, I'm really looking for the, a mentor because I'm trying to grow an XYZ. And they'll tell you if there's not time in their busy schedules or lives. They, they're usually really good about that. Um, another way to, just so you know, a cup of coffee goes a long way to start the conversation. Is it okay if we get together for a cup of coffee or, or sweet tea or whatever it is? I know we're in the South. Okay. So it just invite them out and start the conversation. Um, sometimes you kind of have to interview them and get to know them a little bit more before you really delve into a full-blown mentor-mentee relationship. Andre. So I'll say if you follow the model that uh, Shelly and Marta just said, people are typically honored. So if somebody walks in my office and says that, even if I'm as busy as can be and I got a million projects going on, I would be so happy that somebody thought that highly of me that they wanted me to be their mentor and I would make time to build that relationship and give them the guidance that they need. So my mentor is in Las Vegas. Her name is Carrie Hall. And one thing that uh, <laughs> she taught me a lot, I worked with her for over hey, 10 Andrew, years out there. Can you hold it? To, okay. Yeah, a little bit. Because so, you just want all those Australian people. Okay, hello, Australia. Okay, all right. So <laughs> Carrie Hall, she's in Las Vegas. We worked together for over 10 years. She was an amazing person. But one thing I taught her was she was a workaholic. Carrie would work seven days a week. If she wasn't there, she thought the hotel and all the restaurants and the entertainment, everything that was going on would just stop. So I'm all about having a good home work balance. I, 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 you tell that to my team now, but I, I sat down with her and I had that conversation. I said, Carrie, if you take a day off, Flamingo Las Vegas is still going to, to run. Like these places are machines, these, these properties, if you take a day off, so it took it, it was hard for her because she had been doing this for years. She just she was a workaholic and she started doing it. And she came to me one day. And she was like, Andre, thank you so much. <laughs> My kids, they, they didn't know what to think. But when I wasn't going to work one day, they, they were so happy. They're giving me hugs and kisses. And they thought I was sick that I, I wasn't going to work. But so then she started taking at least one or sometimes even two days a week off, which was crazy. But um, it was because we had such a good relationship, I, I felt comfortable to have a conversation with her, and it helped her. And to this day, she still takes at least one day off. Good stuff. So I guess with my situation, it's uh, I was 21 when we met. Like, what do I really have to offer? Okay. I felt like, <laughs> um, you know, outside of a few collaborative, uh, collaborating situations at work, uh, I guess the biggest one was just he was new to the town, and so get him cut, get him into the scene, 
what's going on and stuff like that. Okay. There's usually something you have to offer. Like you have to f actually know yourself well enough and really listen to the other person well to know what it is their strengths and weaknesses are, and then you can probably offer what it is that they need help with. So it's it's a balance. It's it's a relationship like any other in your life. So don't start a mentor-mentee relationship and then just ghost them, okay, because that's not fair to them as well. Um, I do have one sensitive question to ask, and because I do think this happens sometimes. Have any of you ever had a breakup with a mentor? Like it just wasn't working out. No. So it was the situation I talked about earlier. It wasn't necessarily a breakup. Okay. <laughs> but we just did not click. So at first it was just like what we talked about earlier. We were meeting like once a month. We'd get coffee. We'd catch up. We would talk. But then we just stopped meeting, and that relationship stopped. Yeah. Because it, it wasn't genuine. It seemed forced. And I would just tell her a few things. She would tell me few general things yeah everything's good just went on vacation just got back works good but it it wasn't genuine so at some point I think I just stopped sending those meeting requests <laughs> okay <laughs> and it was over okay um, so you do, I mean, it, that it kind of happens naturally, the breakup, if it's not working out. But I just do want to say that, you know, just don't um, expect everyone for it to be a natural fit all the time. Sometimes you have to really get to know the person. You get to see that maybe they made a life choice or, you know, change their career. And then now it's no longer a fit. People evolve, so you can't always expect the person to travel that the entire journey with you and that's why I think it's smart to have more than one mentor you have people with different skill sets and you know okay this one's really good at social media marketing I know I can go to them with questions about this oh this one's really good at writing proposals let me go to them for this kind of stuff so if you have people multiple mentors in different with different areas of expertise you'll have you know the breadth of of mentors that that you need to really help you along in your career. Um, so my next question for you is looking at your industry, because all of you do something a little different, um, what do you think are the qualities that your industry are seeking um, from these youngsters now, these people who are about to finish their degrees in a few years and enter the workforce? So starting with me, I still feel like I am one of the youngsters. Okay. And I'm wondering. It's honest. Maybe I, what personality traits do I need um, <laughs> to continue? Um, I guess to this point, with people that I'm hiring mm -hmm. uh, under me, it's just hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, you can learn how to do stuff. It's just, do you want to do it? Okay. So that sense of like ingrained, innate work ethic, right? Danny Myers, who's a restaurateur, he has this concept called the 51 percenter. And he won't hire anyone unless they have that 51 percent. They have to bring it. They have to have that personality. They have to have that desire to actually want to serve others. And if they don't have it, he doesn't hire them. He's like, I can teach you the other 49 percent. I can teach you how to serve properly. I can teach you how to operate my point of sale system. I can teach you all the ingredients that make our dishes exquisite. But do you bring in that 51%? So that's sort of what you, I think I hear you saying. You know, you have to actually have the work ethic and the desire to perform. So in my world, I think the, one of the biggest things for you all right now, the great part is you are, you're going to have the educational background. So that kind of separates you apart from others that don't as you're going into the workforce. For me, being in the hospitality industry, one big thing starting to interview is personality. Some people have it, some people don't have it, but that's one thing when you're talking about creating an experience for a guest, for a customer, somebody's paying money for a service, if they're going to a Grizz game, if they're eating in a restaurant, a bright personality is... Like, just like what you were saying, Martin, you can teach somebody how to do the computer, you can teach somebody how to serve, you can teach somebody how to do everything, but you can't teach somebody to be a happy person. Some people are either happy or some people are miserable. 
And that's one thing that really jumps out as I'm interviewing people. Are you smiling? Are you making eye contact? You, are you laughing? Are you having a good time? Because if you're doing that with me, you're going to do it with the customer, which in turn creates loyalty because people want to go into those type of environments. If you've ever ate in a restaurant and the person never smiled, they, they didn't look at you, that doesn't make you want to go back. That doesn't make you want to go back to the Grizz game if you go there and everybody's miserable. You want to go where people are happy. So I think education, having a happy, upbeat, and positive, make eye contact, smile, that's going to get you a long way because you're going to have the educational background already. And then work experience is great as well. So to as you're going through college, get, it, get the full experience because you're going to work the rest of your life. But also if you have some work experience as you're kind of getting towards graduation, it helps as well because it will separate you from other people too. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, with the Memphis Grizzlies, we hire part-time employees as well as full-time employees. So there's a whole game day side of operations where we're hiring conversions crew, we're hiring box office attendants, team attendants, um, all, all sorts of part-time personnel. But then there's also the professional side where I need a marketing coordinator or a data analyst or someone for my community engagement team or someone for the sales team. So if I look at everybody that I hire, literally everybody that I hire, I boiled it down to three things, three things. So the first thing that I look for is I'm looking for this person to be dependable. And what that means to me is, is can I depend on you to show up? Not just the 8 to 5 or the 6 to 10 or the 5.30 to 9.30 at night. Can I depend on you for your critical thinking? Can I depend on you for your ideas? Can I depend on you to contribute to the growth of my company? Can I depend on you to be there for other employees when they are in a season where they're a little weak? I need you to show up, and that's all about dependability. And then the second thing I look for is I look for someone who really wants to make a difference, not just for us, but for themselves. And what I mean by that is I want someone who wants to make a difference in the organization, someone who wants to make a difference for their customers or their fans or their guests. I want someone who wants to make their boss look good. I want someone who wants to make a difference for their family, to position their family for a better life. I want all of that. And so that takes a person who has a certain desire to do good work. So that's the second thing that I look for. And then the third thing that I look for is honesty. Can I trust you? If I look at a resume and it says that you have this skill set, can I trust that you really have that skill set or are you just BSing me? Mm -hmm. Because it happens all the time. Can I trust that you're going to not just show up and work a game, but if you see something on the floor that is distracting or could be a safety hazard or is just trash and needs to be picked up, can I trust you that you're gonna pick it up and throw it away because you're part of the organization? Mm -hmm. I know you're not service master, you're not, you know, you're not the person who takes out the trash, but can I, can I trust you to pick up that piece of paper? So I look for three things. I look for honesty, I look for someone who wants to make a difference, which is that 51%, and I look for somebody who's dependable. Um, Chef Bill, I know we are running low on time, and I didn't want to end this without asking questions. Um, do any of you have questions that we want to ask the panel? He's He's One got thing. something burning to say. Let it's me just, let him it's, say it's it because I work with the man. Uh, okay. I look for all of that, but I also look for pirates because I'm the, I'm the captain of a pirate ship in the culinary industry. I want someone who's willing to walk the plank with me. Oh, wow. I like that. I'm happy. Did you hear that? Did you get the analogy? So walk the plank with him. Like go down Take the, that the leap. path. Take That's the right. leap with him. You know? So did anyone have questions here? I want them to hear the question as well. So does anyone have a question? No? You sure? Don't be shy. Okay, so now here's, here's what I'm going to have you do. Take out your cell phones. 
you're never going to hear this in regular classes, but take out your cell phones, and I want you to get a picture of our panel because I want you to remember all the names that are up here. And what you're going to do is you're going to jump on LinkedIn and you're going to try to connect with each of these people, all right, because you want to follow them in their careers. And who knows a year from now, two years from now, when you're looking for that internship or that opportunity or you remember some Oh, I remember that analogy about walking the plank, right? Let me, let me talk to him some more about that. You want to be able to get in touch with them. And people's phone numbers change, okay? Their jobs will change. But if you're connected with them on LinkedIn, you're going to remember that. So just take a quick picture. That's why I actually try to put these names in bold for you so you can do this activity. Make sure Andres is showing there, okay? <laughs> Smile. Let's <laughs> look at Chef Bill. <laughs> okay. So please make sure you're linking in with everyone. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Again, my name is Marta Lopez Flor, and thank you so much for your time and attention this afternoon. Oh, that's right. The parking pass is up for grabs. So do the survey. That's money. <laughs> that's money there. Okay. So. so I have small tokens of appreciation for each of you on behalf of the Kemmons Wilson School. Okay, hi y'all, how are y'all? Um, thanks for coming. Um, this is the Civic Engagement Board session. So today we're just gonna talk a little bit about how you can get involved um, with our events and just with events in the community in general. Um, and you're gonna learn about what we do on the board and we're gonna do a little service project at the end. Okay, so the Civic Engagement Board is just the like primary site for volunteer uh, volunteerism at the University of Memphis so every single volunteer anything that is connected with the U of M and the community comes through us first so we're like sort of the bridge that connects the community to the campus and there are seven of us on this board and we also have a little bit like lesser um, leadership opportunities for you to take if you wanted to get more involved with us it's called site leaders and we'll talk more about that later and we've done a ton of things so far this year. We've had kitten yoga with the Humane Society, and we've helped out at the Botanic Garden. And yes, so we'd love to see you come out to some of our events, and we'll talk more about that. Hi, everyone. So we're going to start off introducing ourselves for the Civic Engagement Board. And my name is Kina Vu, and I'm a biology and Spanish major, and I'm from Memphis. I'm a junior. And I'm the Days of Service Coordinator, so what I do is we, I make or coordinate really big service events. We did one at the beginning of the school year, and we broke our record. We had like 325 students come and volunteer. We went to St. Jude, the Memphis Food Bank, or Mid-South Food Bank, and many other places in the community. And our director is Yasmin Mason, and she could not be here today because she had a test. But what she does is that she keeps our board together, and she helps coordinate everything and helps everyone get their job done so we can impact the Memphis community. And she works with Zach Carr, who is our advisor for the board, basically. And, yeah. Okay. And my name is Liz Murphy, and I'm a sophomore international business major, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm the Service on Saturday coordinator. So basically, we host three of those a semester, so there's six total in the year. And it's just about 100 Memphis students who come together to volunteer on Saturday mornings. Hi, my name is Kate Baker. I am a junior professional studies with a concentration as a child life specialist major from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I am the RSO liaison or the registered, registered student organization liaison. And I basically am the point of contact for all service events for the RSOs on campus. So I send out emails about any and every opportunity to that we provide um, every semester. 
I'm Desiree Carter. I'm a sophomore math education major. I am the Greek liaison for uh, the Civic Engagement Board. Basically, I just keep the Greek community at the University of Memphis um, engaged and aware of all of our events and make sure that they have all the information that they need. And that's really it. Hello everyone, my name is Lynn Hong. I'm a current junior, double majoring accounting and marketing with a minor in social media marketing. So I am an assistant coordinator of special projects. Basically, I would create monthly special projects that y'all can participate and engage. Um, my name is Chloe McNeil and I am the co-director of the marketing. I'm Caroline Hawkins and I'm a senior public relations major and I'm the other part of the marketing team. Um, and basically what we do is we make flyers for all of our events, um, post on social media, post pictures of you guys if you come to our events, and just keep everyone updated through social media. We are just going to show you like, what to do starting from the very beginning if you wanted to volunteer with the University of Memphis and where you'd find all that information. So here you can like narrate as I. So basically, you can just Google Volunteer Odyssey at University of Memphis. And then you can click on that first one. And there's a link here that says Volunteer Odyssey Partner Website because we're who they partner with. They're just a volunteer platform for the Memphis community. And then click on that. Okay, so there's a little description about what Volunteer Odyssey is and what they do. So you click on the Volunteer Compass platform, which is where you actually find all those sites. And then I'm already logged in, but normally there'd be a little icon here that says login or sign up and you would choose login. Um, with the University of Memphis, you can just put in your password and your username and it brings you to this page. And then you go to My Activity and Groups. And you should see as a Memphis student, Days of Service, Service on Saturday, and University of Memphis. So if you really wanted to find out about any of these events, you just click on the link here. So Days of Service, here you can see at the, well, there's nothing coming up, but <laughs> if you wanted to, you'd just scroll down and see what there is to be offered. Okay. Yeah, that's not going to show anything. So, like for service on Saturday, this upcoming November one on the 16th, you can just click on there, and it shows you how many spots are available, um, where and what the sites are and any other pieces of information you would need to know. And then to register, if I wanted to register for Compost Ferry, I would just come here, click register, and continue. So yeah. You can also volunteer, like not just like Memphis-based volunteer opportunities, but the, like other opportunities in Memphis in general in the city. Like you go to like Memphis Botanical Gardens mm -hmm. and like other nonprofits around the city that help Everyone in the city, like, you can volunteer for literally anything. And you can filter to whatever you're looking for. So if you were looking for a date, you could find something for that specific day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, really fun activities. If you have nothing to do on a Saturday, you can just help out the community. Yes. And it's really fun. Great experience. It's memorable. Does anyone have any questions about the website? Okay. Thank you for listening. Can you <laughs> go back to for the oh. oh. Yes. Um, oh, the microphone. So if you, oh, wait. Let oh, me get Okay. So if you were to, like, do a service opportunity that wasn't through Volunteer Odyssey, could you still register it on the website? Does that make sense? Um, So since you are a Memphis student, there will be an option after like you serve um, where you can create an impact about your experience. You can also choose to share your impact with the University of Memphis or like whatever Greek community you're a part of or anything else that you're a part of. And then those hours will be verified by an administrator from any organization and from the Civic Engagement Board. Yeah. So yes.
Okay, so so we work out of the office for the Center for uh, Service Learning and Volunteerism. That's the office that we work out of this year. It actually is an office that just recently opened up, um, so it's new this semester. Um, we, in this office, we help students um, get connected with volunteer options to get hours for scholarships, for clubs, for good organizations, whatever you may need. Um, we also oversee student groups such as Civic Engagement Board, um, Alternative Break Experience, and things such like that. Um, so, um, I'm just going to click this. So here's our website for our office. Um, if you wanted to kind of get more involved with us, also here's some, some really cool stats about us. So during the 2018-2019 school year, over 3,300 students volunteered, over 18,000 hours, um, and the economic impact was over $448,000 back to the greater Memphis community. So as you can tell, we are making an impact in Memphis um, with all of the volunteer that we're, all the volunteer work that we're doing, um, the students are really getting involved, and it's been a wonderful thing to be a part of as um, a site leader, as a board member, to see like these kind of numbers coming back from one school year. That's crazy. That's like a huge impact that the university is making on the Memphis area, as well as helping students to get service hours for for clubs, for events, for scholarships, um, stuff like that's really important. And so. On here, you can also find information about service on Saturday. Um, you can click these links to sign up. These ones have already passed. Um, but it tells you if you want to know when the next dates are or whatever, but you don't want to go all the way through the volunteer odyssey situation, you can just come to our website, and it's all right here, as well as the different days of service. So it'll have all the ones we've already done. Next year, we've got an MLK day, um, Read Across America. So you can come here to kind of plan ahead if you know you need service hours for a certain thing or something like that, or you just want to get involved, it's really easy to plan ahead and um, see what we're doing. So, oh, we also do a student volunteer spotlight every month. Um, so this past month was Bree James. It'll be right here. It has a whole thing about the student, um, the volunteer work, and all of that's a really good way to get recognized for your for your volunteering, and it's something that we enjoy doing to try to give back to the students for coming out to our events and volunteering and helping out the greater Memphis area. So why is service important? So we're gonna go ahead and break down into groups and, and discuss about it.
slides all the way back here. And if you want to see something, just sort of that. And so I like that change. You can just go on to your video by your day. Okay. Sounds nice. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks guys for uh, breaking out in the groups and participating. Um, if you can read it, try to read something that the other groups put, but we wanted to um, ask for at least one person from each group to share something that they said um, so the other group can hear from you guys. You want to share? Ooh, I got a microphone, thank you. So where did I volunteer at? I volunteered at Bandmasters. What did I do? I guided high school bands. So basically what I got out of it was I'm from Madison, Mississippi, and, I, and Madison's a really well-off city. It's like one of the most well-off cities in Mississippi. And so the band I went to was really well-off. And the band that I had to guide was a band that was only about 14 band members. And so when I was in band, whenever we marched, whenever we went to competitions, we always got all superiors. And I never looked at that as like a big deal or as something to be proud about. I always thought that's just what we do. If we didn't do it, our band director would get fired. But with that band, they went and they performed well and they tried their best and they didn't get like superiors, but they were still proud and very happy of what they did. It made me realize that like in life, you can be proud and you can be happy about the small things you do, like waking up on time, taking a shower, and then just anything else. Thank you. Uh, who from the other group wants to share their experience? Okay, so I talked about two things, but I'll talk about the Thistle and Bee because that was probably my favorite. Um, so I went to Thistle and Bee through um, a service on Saturday experience, and what did I do there? I'm trying to remember because it was a long time ago. It was like my freshman year. Um, I think we did, like, put little packets together for the women. So this will be is like an organization that helps women that are abused in like an abusive relationships. And so that's like a safe place for them to go. And it's kind of like a self-sufficient organization. So they like make things for the women. And like, I know they use like honeybees, um, the honey from them and like put it in their stuff. I'm not really sure exactly what all they do, but it was a great organization. The people were re really nice. And so um, how did it impact me? I think it just showed me a lot um, about kind of like what you said, like what people go through and like how much that meant to them that they can go there and be safe and have everything provided for them. And um, through that, I was able to get my Greek organization um, to come and volunteer there as well. Everyone loved it. So it was a great experience. Thanks, Bailey. Okay, so next thing we're going to do, since we are the Civic Engagement Board, we're going to do a service activity. And we're just going to be writing and drawing cards for people in the military that can't be home these for these holidays that are upcoming, like New Year's, Hanukkah, and Christmas. So we have some construction paper here, and y'all can pick a color, and we have markers, and we're just going to make some cards. And we're going to send it to an organization that sends it to people in the military. Get however many you want. Yeah. Pick okay, all the colors you want. Do you just want us to write happy holidays? Oh, yeah. Any holidays, yeah. <laughs> now, like, thank you for your service.
Hey, so we have a few more things to talk about, but you can keep on working while we discuss them. So we are having an upcoming service on Saturday, this, or next Saturday, on November 16th, 
from 9 to 12.30. We still have plenty of spots available, so we hope to see you all there. And um, next year, we are having the Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service um, to kick off the school year, so mark that in your cal calendars as well. And if you're looking for any leadership opportunities, uh, come sign up to be a site leader. Um, it's something wonderful to get your service hours and to put something on your resume as well. And um, it's a great opportunity for some leadership. Um, so just to explain a little bit more what a site leader is, um, basically you will go to our service event, service on Saturdays, days of service, um, and kind of just... Um, kind of facilitate and make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, it's a good, simple leadership position to have. You um, just make sure everyone's accounted for, make sure everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing at the site. And a few days beforehand, you'll email the um, contact at the place we're going to and just make sure we're still good to go. So it's really easy. Service events once a month, um, service on Saturdays. So if you're interested, I would recommend it. I did it for like a year and a half probably. Bailey's done it. If you have any questions, a lot of us have done it. Um, so if you have any questions, you can ask us. But we really need site leaders, so if you're interested, please sign up. And also stay connected with us and all of our events and all of our, our, bleh, all of our volunteers. Um, you can follow our Instagram page at CEB underscore U of M. We do follow back and um, sign up with us on Volunteer Odyssey as well. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Thank y'all so much for coming out. Um, they're saying to meet up in the UC, or not the UC, what is ballroom. it? The ballroom. Uh, whenever you're finished with your cards. So thank you so much for coming out. Woo. Also, uh, if you have to oh, yeah. fill out these uh, surveys, I don't know if you've heard of any of the other sessions, but you'll be entered in to win a semester parking pass.